Hello, beautiful, wonderful, mythical, fabulous listeners. Welcome to the first day of the month. And you know what that means. Simple English Listening Day, your favorite podcast here on the first of every month. That's the time we sit down together and I speak to you in simpler English about whatever, whatever interesting topics I can find or life experiences that are interesting at the time. Remember, on the app CastBox, you can change the speed of the podcast to make it easier and more difficult. Here I speak to you in simpler English so you can pick up new language naturally and also review the language that you already know. So today I am in a new, fascinating and unique country in Cyprus. Do you know where Cyprus is? Hmm. Just clearing my throat. Well, I didn't really know myself until I got here three weeks ago after I landed and after a few days of walking around, I thought to myself, I don't really know where I am. Now, I thought Cyprus was just below Greece, near Crete, maybe. I knew I was in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, somewhere. So, I looked on Google Maps and I was surprised. Cyprus? Cyprus is right next to Israel, Lebanon, Syria. As the bird flies, well, to be more specific, in English we say, as the crow flies. As the crow flies, we're about a hundred kilometers from the coast of Syria and right near Lebanon, near Israel. I'm also a ferry to Turkey. A ferry means a boat for passengers. A ferry. It's only a ferry to Turkey. Actually, I'm thinking about going to Turkey after here in two or three weeks. For those who don't know, I'm a remote worker, a digital nomad. I travel with my laptop and my microphone and do all kinds of various creative projects to make my living. I used to be an English teacher full time. Maybe some of you remember those days for nine years, for nine years in a past life, it seems now. How cool would it be to take a ferry to Syria? Unfortunately, that's not possible right now. So Cyprus has had a very tumultuous past, a varied past. Tumultuous is an adjective, meaning confused, disorderly, excited. In case you didn't realize, today I'm introducing you to Cyprus and sharing what I've learned so far. Oh, many people have settled here and governed here. Egyptians, Venetians from Venice, Greeks, Turks from when Turkey was the Ottoman Empire, Romans, the British, the French, and you can see all these influences here, especially in cities such as Nicosia, which is the capital, and Paphos. Kyrenia is in the north. Cyprus is split into two, two countries. There is a long and sad border in the middle, which separates the two countries. The southern country is the Republic of Cyprus, and the northern country is the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. How mad! How did this happen? And the south of Cyprus is Greek in culture, language, religion, etc. The north of Cyprus is Turkish in culture, language, religion, etc. Well, so there was a war, a war. Since the 1500s, Greece and Turkey have been fighting over Cyprus. The most recent conflict, conflict, meaning war, the most recent conflict was in 1974. Turkey invaded Cyprus. They moved thousands of soldiers here and there was fighting between the Turks and the Greek Cypriots. In the end, they split the country in two. And how interesting is this? There's a border right in the middle of the main high street in Nicosia. So the main 
shopping road where all the bars and restaurants and cafes are. The border is in the middle of Ledra Street, that street. Once you cross the border, showing your passport and your PCR test, you are in Turkish culture. So suddenly all the signs, shops, magazines, and uh, are Turkish with Turkish products, Turkish language everywhere, people drinking Turkish coffee, a different religion, of course, mosques instead of churches, Turkish kind of food, everything. Turkish magazines, Turkish money as well. They use the Turkish lira instead of the euro. So the euro in the south of Cyprus, the Turkish lira in the north. And if you walk five minutes south, you're back in Greek Cyprus, which is more Western, more Turkish. It's just like being in Greece, to be honest. After Turkey invaded Cyprus in 1974, all the Greeks who lived in the north had to move to the south. And all the Turks in the south had to move to the north. So right now, still many people had to leave property, possessions. Some people lost everything, and some of them had to move to the other side of the country. So now, all the Greeks are in the south, all the Turks are in the north. But before, they were all mixed up before the war. Yeah? Before the land, the country was split into two. So it's a big legal mess. Yeah, it's complicated. Sometimes... Sometimes, if you walk around the old town of Nicosia, the divided capital, you can see bullet holes in the walls. Bullets from guns, from the gunfights in the streets in 1974. Here, I'm in an Airbnb with a lovely lady from Sri Lanka, as well as a Christian philosopher, who always often tries to convert me most days, actually. He's a, a, a doomsday Christian, which means he thinks the end of the world will come in 2024 and that Trump is the Antichrist. Yeah, and a few other things. That the COVID vaccine, the vaccine, is the mark, the sign of the beast, the devil. And this is all based on, interestingly, on what he sees in the prophecies in the, uh, the Bibles. So, I mean, you could say we have long and deep conversations over dinner. It's nice to have some company away from home. And his dog is amazing company too. The best. The breed is a Jag Terrier. Check it out, a Jag Terrier. And they were bred specifically to be good company to people. And I am quite inspired to, for me to get a Jag Terrier, actually. Talking about religion... Here there is a tomb of St. Lazarus. A tomb. A tomb is a place where you keep the body of a dead person, their corpse. St. Lazarus is a Bible character who died. But then Jesus apparently resurrected him, brought him back to life. And after that, he never smiled for some reason. Lazarus. That's the... Uh, the story, the legend, and he brought Christianity to Larnaca in Cyprus, and he was the priest there for the rest of his, well, his second life, I guess, until he died an old man, and his tomb is at the front of the church, and I've seen it. It's, a, it's an interesting experience. It's a very powerful experience for some people. In Cyprus, in around, you know, 3000 to 5000 BC, they used to put the family tomb under the, the house. Yeah, I went to a museum yesterday and I learned this. Imagine sleeping with your dead relatives and parents and grandparents underneath your floorboards, underneath the, the floor. Sounds a bit creepy to me. Most days I go for a walk in the morning and then work all afternoon and into the evening. The food here is basically different kinds of flamed grilled meat and kebabs, both the Turkish and Greek sides. Now that's one thing that's culturally similar between the two cultures, in my opinion, the food. But they would say, no, you know, obviously it's completely different. But I mean, let's be honest, it's just different kinds of kebabs, right? Maybe one's got tzatziki sauce and one doesn't. Anyway. 
On one of these walks, I found a real, uh, 100% real, authentic Vietnamese diner. I went inside and had a conversation in Vietnamese to the owner, who's from Haiphong near Hanoi. We had a sentimental conversation and both really missed Vietnam. I think maybe we were both about to burst into tears. He made me some pho, or pho, as they say in Vietnam, which is the Vietnamese noodle soup, and it was exactly like in Hanoi. It was very sentimental for me. Sentimental meaning emotional. He even had the exact same sauces that you get in Vietnam. I mean, Nicosia is a town of about 200,000 people, so there can't be that many Vietnamese there to appreciate his fine, authentic cooking. Anyways, good luck to him. I loved it. Actually, I've been back there three times. I'll probably go back there today. Although it's six euros for some pho, and in Vietnam, the exact same bowl is like one euro. But whatever, you know, I'm not going to take a plane just for... and not get into the country just for some pho. Anyway, so I've been alone here now for one month, alone. But I've really realized that you are never alone in this day and age. All of your friends are at the touch of a button. All of your friends are just a phone call away. So most days when I go for a morning walk, I chat to an old friend. That's something I've tried to do more. Catch up with old friends. So like once every two or three, or once every two days, I'll just ring for like one hour, an old friend. And it's really good, actually, for my morale, for one's general well-being. Because ultimately, the most important thing in our lives is our relationships, for our happiness. And I'll come back to that in a minute. I read an article recently about the things that people regret most when they're dying. That they regret most when they're dying. Regret means the things that we wish we did differently. So when they're on their deathbed and they regret, they had an interviews with nurses and they would say these things. And you know what they said? They said that what they regret is that they wish they spent more time with their families and also that they didn't lose contact with their friends. And mostly things along the lines of they wish they worked less and you know, valued money less and more family and relationships and friends. I saw an inspirational TED talk, TED, TED talk about happiness. And they said that the most important thing in life, as I said before, for your happiness is not money or your job, but you know what it is? It's your relationships. Your relationships with other human beings will determine your happiness throughout your life more than anything else. So remember those old friends Pick up the phone before it's not too late. Being alone. I find I get more creative in my mind. And I've thought of many ideas I'm really happy with for my projects and work. You get to know yourself better. Like, who, who are you? And you, one becomes more comfortable with oneself in long periods of loneliness. It's good for the the heart and the mind and the soul, I would say. And on the rare occasion that I do speak with someone new, I really enjoy it. Not like before. Like I make a great effort. It's a great novelty and exciting part of the day. Also, I can focus more on my passions and creativity 100% without different people and forces interfering, which I really appreciate. Another good thing about being alone for long periods, for me anyway, is that I find that I naturally start focusing, concentrating on my spirit, my progress in my heart and soul. I meditate more and I make more time for walking and thinking, reflecting. I reflect more about my place in the universe, in the cosmos, making peace with it. Reflect means to think deeply. I reflect and uh, about this kind of reflection and discovery. Maybe it's because I'm alone and it's something that gives me comfort. And one aspect of, 
of God is that right is it is a refuge a shelter for the lonely right and Christians would say that Jesus gives them some kind of comfort when when they're alone I'm also reflecting thinking deeply reflecting on this feeling that everything feels automatic somehow maybe an illusion of the human experience is that we think there's free will free will but on a deeper level maybe there isn't so much free will you know and things kind of just automatically happen it's just a thought just a thought maybe everything is just happening we are just an experience and whatever may be may be we are the universe just expressing itself we are all one consciousness maybe experiencing life subjectively imagine that i've been thinking about the ego too the ego our sense of self me what am i maybe it's just an idea just a thought maybe it's not actually a real thing you know a collective fiction that we in society tell ourselves i'm an engineer i'm david i am a proud american i'm a republican these things are fundamentally they're labels right you're not david and i'm not tristan naturally they're just labels that our parents slapped on us but nobody naturally has a name man-made forms they're just concepts made from language like they aren't in nature maybe we're just looking just looking at a collection of thoughts using our human memory learning and saying oh i am those but why maybe it's just an idea a fiction a collective fiction maybe it's very limiting right limiting but maybe rather we are unlimited unlimited beings here's a mind-blowing idea for you you're not the food that you eat you're not the sounds that you hear you're not the table that you touch you're not the window that you see so why are you the thoughts that you think maybe they're just that another sense seeing hearing touching smelling thinking senses maybe they're just another thing that appears and disappears in your consciousness right we can try it for ourselves we can sit and watch our thinking sitting down watching our mind our thinking a thought appears it disappears another thought appears it disappears a sound appears disappears my voice my voice appears disappears a thought appears disappears are we the forms are we the senses are we the space Ooh, that's the question i don't know what do you think always question always discover explore the consciousness maybe we're just consciousness with various forms and experiences appearing and disappearing within it on a deeper level maybe some philosophies believe that's what we are fundamentally the space the awareness the consciousness rather than the forms concepts and thoughts and that's what makes sense to me right now so i you know thinking about these things when i'm alone i have lots of time to think maybe the mind the thinking is just another sense ultimately it just reflects what's around you reflects like a mirror it processes information the mind slightly differently to the next man based on your genes your dna your upbringing how the chemicals work in your brain you know the things that give you your your unique color your coloring your personality 
But the mind is just maybe another sense in your subjective operating system. Anyway, for me, these ideas are extremely freeing, liberating. Our consciousness is truly unlimited, by the way. Maybe we are all one consciousness, all one life force, one universe, experiencing itself, expressing itself, learning and understanding itself subjectively in our own little subjective worlds. Anyways, enough of my spiritual ramblings. Ramblings just means talking for too long. Ramblings. Although I miss my friends and family, I really like what's happening right now. Finding more peace, more understanding, as well as good progress with my job because I have much more space to concentrate without, you know, the family asking me if I can look after my nephews or nieces. Tristan, can you take the dog for a walk? Go buy some milk, which I'm happy to do. And it's lovely to do these things when I'm in the UK with my family. But it's nice to have a break. That's all I'm saying. Healthy to have a break. My summary to this episode is being alone is a healthy and good experience. Even the Buddha, the Buddha advocated loneliness to further spiritual understanding. Don't be afraid of traveling or going away alone for a long period. You'll learn a lot about yourself. And that, my friends, is wisdom, right? Remember, I release these podcasts every first day of the month. Every first day of the month. Next month, we have a podcast I recorded with my friend Nikki in Italy a couple of months ago. Uh, it's about conspiracy theories, some funny ones, some hilarious and really weird ones, some mental ones, and some that we might believe in more than we don't believe in, interestingly enough. Okay, lots of love, everyone. This is a pleasure, an absolute pleasure as always, to be part of your English learning experience. And uh, so take care. Stay beautiful.